If you have your Bibles, and I hope you bring your Bibles, turn to the book of Nehemiah, and we're going to begin preaching a series of messages through this great book in the Old Testament. Someone told me that Nehemiah was the shortest person in the Bible. Nehemiah was the way they pronounced it, so... A lot of things they've already been, I've already learned a lot of things, you know, that I didn't know that I was supposed to know. Nehemiah was a prophet that had the opportunity to stay with the remnant of the children of Israel or the Jewish people in Jerusalem. But he decided in the process of finding himself where God wanted him to stay rather uh, with the leadership, the judging fashion in another place other than Jerusalem. If we take the whole book, of Jerusalem, we see different incremental things taking place in the book. We see uh, the discovery that was made as Nehemiah found out the condition of the remnant that was in Jerusalem. And then we find out how God used Jeremiah to move toward accomplishing the purpose for which God had called him or what God wanted done, and that is to rebuild the walls around Jerusalem. And a lot of interesting things about that wall in that there are several gates in the wall. And each one of those gates has a particular uh, reference to or meaning for uh, something that takes place in the New Testament. And then there's the area where there is victory. And all of the things that took place in the development of uh, circumstances and coming to the place where the wall was to be rebuilt or wall was to be built, there are many, many spiritual principles that we can find in the Word of God that will help us as we go through our lives as believers in Christ. So our focal text this morning is going to be the, uh, when I get there, <clears throat> focal passage is going to be um, the response that he has as he hears his brother telling him what's taking place. Verse 4 says, As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and I wept and I mourned for days, and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And then he goes on to explain to us the prayer that he brought before the Lord. The name Nehemiah means comforted by God. And it deals with a man who had a lot of compassion a lot of concern for his people. And Nehemiah, being a simple kind of guy, nothing indicates to us that he's anything uh, beyond special. He was just one of, the, one of the survivors of the Jews who desired to see uh, God be glorified again from his life and from his ministry. He cared about traditions he cared about the needs of the present time and the hopes of the future. He cared about the heritage of the people and the ancestry and all of the things that were, that were a part of the Jewish heritage. But most of all, he cared about honoring God. And this morning, I've selected four things that show us his care and his concern. Have everybody had anybody ask you, how are you feeling today? And you really thought, well, they really don't want to know. 
Or have you ever asked anybody how they're feeling out of habit and you really didn't think about whether or not you wanted to know how they were feeling? Well, all of this world that we live in, I think, can be changed if we ever learn to really care. I believe that homes can be changed if we learn how to care for each other. Now, I'm not talking about taking care of, but I'm talking about the emotional feeling or desire to care for. I think churches can be changed when we genuinely care for each other. And when we genuinely care about our community and the circumstances of the community and whether they're lost or saved, I think this whole community around this church can be changed as we see individuals beginning to really care for the community where we live. God's done so many things this week that have actually been unbelievable in bringing together this whole uh, the circumstances that we have today surrounding this message, which God started preparing my heart to preach several weeks ago, but just this week, the doors that have opened for us to have ministries in our elementary school, in our, in our high schools, and in our, in our county schools, those doors that have opened as we see opportunities, now whether or not we walk through those doors, and demonstrate to this community whether or not we really care or whether we're just kind of willing to float along like we are and maybe have been and thinking that all the things are going to get better. But you know what? They really don't get any better until people know how much we care. And so as we, as we look at this passage today, I want you to let God speak to your heart about how you care in your family, how you care in your church. Do we really care uh, about things in our church? And do we really care about things in this nation that we're so blessed to live in? So how much do we care about what is taking place? Well, first of all, Nehemiah was a man who cared enough to inquire. That sounds rather simple, doesn't it? But he really wanted to know, and the way that he found out what was going on with, the, uh, with his, his family, with his heritage, the way he found it out was he asked his brother, uh, Hanai, one of my brothers came, in verse 2, one of my brothers came with certain men from Judea, and I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. I want to know, says Nehemiah, how these things are. Now, Nehemiah was a cupbearer for the king, which was a kind of a special position. He was a man who had the responsibility of tasting food and, and a drink before the king would eat. Uh, he was a person who uh, lived a very cultured and uh, evidently a very educated, uh, perhaps a a uh, man that was a good-looking man, a lot of attributes that he had. Uh, and Nehemiah didn't have to trouble himself with the circumstances of the remnant of Jews that had been left in Jerusalem. But he chose to do the things necessary to help to relieve some of the problems that was in Jerusalem and he exercised that by demonstrating that he genuinely cared. And here's something we always learn from, from God's leadership. God always has a man or a person in a place when he wants to accomplish something. God wants to accomplish through that individual. So he had Nehemiah in the courtyard of the king. He had Joseph down in Egypt when it came time for, for Egypt to be freed and for God's people to be magnified. He had Daniel in Babylon. And he has you at North Lanier. He has you in this place. When God wants to do a work, he does that work and he prepares the workers. 
Nehemiah was probably having a very normal day. Not anything exciting about what was going on with him. And, and uh, he heard that his, his brother had come. And so he wanted to go and visit with him. And, and he did. And he found out the news that things were not going really well for his uh, family, if you would, in Jerusalem. Just an ordinary day. I, th- I, I would imagine it was an ordinary day when David was called from his sheep to bring a nation back to God. I imagine that it was a pretty ordinary day for Peter and Andrew and James and John when they were mending their nets and Jesus walked by and said, come and I'll make you to be fishers of men. I I don't imagine there was anything that they expected to happen that day when they got up that morning and said, my life's going to be changed today. And I don't know whether you expected that today or not. That you got up this morning thinking that you're going to be confronted by God and challenged by the Lord in such a way that your life's going to be changed. It won't ever be the same from here, a turning point for you. So why did he inquire? He inquired because he cared. How are things in the villas? Are we inquiring, inquiring because we care? How are things with 20% of the elementary school that needs free lunches? Do we inquire because we care? How how are things with this 9,000 children and youth that live in our church field? How are things with them? And are we asking that question because we really care or sometimes out of curiosity? Well, Nehemiah was a man who cared. Not only did he care, but he also cared enough to weep. In verse 4, he says, again, As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and I wept. And I mourned for days, and I continued fasting and praying before God of heaven. He did a pretty normal thing because it was normal for the Jews to be seated when they were praying and weeping before God. And so he sat down and in describing his own condition at that time, he sat down and he says he began to weep. And why was he weeping? He was weeping because he genuinely cared about the remnant that was left in Jerusalem. He was genuinely concerned because he had heard a report that said the walls have been destroyed and there's no protection for the people who live there. The, the temple has been built, but, but then it's open to all the world to come and it needs to be surrounded and protected. He was concerned about that. And he mourned. Deep in his spirit, he was concerned, and he mourned, and he wept. And as he mourned and he wept, he lifted up his voice to the God, not of this world, but to the God of heaven, asking God to give him, ultimately, the ability to be able to go and do what was necessary to rebuild those walls. Now, Nehemiah was a real special kind of guy. And I imagine he was kind of tenderhearted, maybe a little bit like myself or Al. It just doesn't take very much to make us tear up and compassion toward other people. Maybe maybe he was somewhat like Jeremiah who said that my head were waters and my eyes were as a fountain of tears that I might weep day and night for the slain of my sisters and my daughters, that I might weep day and night. Think about that concern that you would have to have for something that would make you that burdened and that much concerned. And then we look over in the New Testament and we find Paul who instructed us to serve the Lord with tears. And then we see our Lord Jesus weeping over a city because when he looked at that city, he saw them lost and undone and in need of a shepherd. But instead of them seeking after salvation, they were trying to have their bodies mended and having food given to them because they were hungry. But Jesus genuinely cared about them as he 
wept over the city. Nehemiah was crushed with a burden for those of his family and his kin. And that burden increased and increased and increased until finally, as God began to speak to him and give him comfort and give him peace, Nehemiah prayed, he fasted, and he wept. Have we, have we genuinely prayed for our church and our community? Have we genuinely prayed to such a degree that it brought tears to our, our hearts and our mind and to our eyes overflowing with the water of cultivation? Have we really done that? You see, one of the things that Nehemiah knew in the midst of his praying was someone had to do something. And when we look in our church and our situation, the opportunity sheet that you were given today, the simple answer is somebody has got to do something. Now, God has that person or persons prepared, and, and as we look at the building up of what God uh, wants done here in this place, he's already got the workers that he wants. He already knows who they are, where they are, and he knows where you sit. <laughs> and, and God deals with us about the deeds. Uh, Jeremiah was a person who cared enough that he prayed and so getting beyond the physical part of his praying, in verse 5, he says, And I said, O Lord God of heaven, not of this world, the great and awesome God, as he praised him, the God who keeps the covenants and steadfast love of those who love him and keep his commandments. I'm praying. And as he prays, he identifies, first of all, the one who he's praying to. Secondly, he praises him. And then as we go through this prayer that Jeremiah, I mean, Nehemiah prays, we see him spending a great deal of time confessing. But as he prayed and confessed, he wasn't saying, Lord, I'm confessing their sins. He said, we have sinned. We have sinned. We have we have come short of what God's intended purpose was for us. We, as a nation, sinned against God. No one person can sin without it impacting others. You remember Achan? The whole nation was paralyzed and could not go forward because of Achan's sin. And it took a while for Joshua to discover that sin, but when he did, God was able to release a whole nation. You see, when you and I sin, it's never alone. But it's always going to affect others. And when God lays something on our heart, a burden in our life, we are the missionary that God's calling to do that particular thing as he puts it in our path. And so he, he prayed, and as he lifted up his voice to the Lord, he lifted it up, first of all, with confidence in the power of God, and then confidence in the faithfulness of God, and then confidence that God would raise up the people. I spent most of this week in my mind, in my meditations, in my prayer times asking, Lord, raise up the people. The needs are there. The opportunities here. We want our church to be effective in reaching lost people for Christ. We want that. And so we have to be willing to say, Lord, use me. God, raise up your people. He prayed that, that God's will would be done and accomplished on earth. You know, we pray often, and we pray like we want our will to be done in heaven. In other words, We've decided what we want, and so we invite God to get involved with it. But our praying ought to be rather to hear what God wants and get his, his will done here on earth, not ours in heaven. And so as we pray and seek his face, as we're admonished in the book of Ephesians, chapter 3, verse 20, he says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power that he works within us. We haven't even begun to ask God for what he can do. 
we haven't even begun to tap the resources, the power that's at hand that God has for us. And so as we pray, first thing that happens, God begins to work in the person who's doing the praying. Nehemiah wasn't asking for God to send somebody else. He was asking God to use him. Isaiah didn't ask God to send somebody else. He said, Lord, here I am, use me. Anywhere we look, God begins to work in our life and and in the life of that person who is praying. And as Nehemiah prayed, his burden grew heavier, his vision became greater, and his need, the needs were more clearly defined as he sought the Lord. Prayer also keeps our heads and hearts together. If that wasn't true, I would probably run way out ahead of the Lord sometimes. But prayer keeps us all focused on what God wants. And we move at God's time, and in God's timing, we seek for God's will to be done. And so as we pray, God tells us what to do. He tells us when to do it, and he tells us how to do it. I'm never... I never take lightly the statement, this is what God said. I never want that statement to be trite coming from my life. I believe this is what God wants. Because I will never stand here to say to you anything that I do not believe God would have us do. After spending time alone with the Lord, seeking God, how can we reach this community for Christ. And then God begins to show us. Nehemiah, he had already planned to go to Jerusalem and supervise the rebuilding of the wall that was there, but he didn't ask God to send somebody else. He simply made himself available to the Lord. Now, because he was a cupbearer, he had some obstacles to overcome because he needed to go back and actually get permission from the king to go do God's will. And we'll talk about that part of it next week. But let me share these last thoughts. First of all, Nehemiah finished that wall in 52 days with God's help. It doesn't take us forever to do what God wants. But we have to start. And as we start, God begins to put it together piece by piece by piece by piece until finally, after he had finished the wall, the people were restored, God God was restored to the area and the people rejoiced in the Lord. Let me give you some examples. It all started with a man who cared. One person, one person who genuinely, honestly, earnestly cared to rebuild that wall, and that was Nehemiah. But if we look through the Bible, we find some others. We find, for example, Abraham genuinely cared for his nephew Lot. And because he did, he interceded with God, and ultimately Lot was delivered from Sodom because Abraham cared. Moses was one man who happened to care, and God spoke to him, and it took Moses 80 years to get the message. And and as, as God began to use him, Moses cared, and as he cared, he was able to lead a nation from captivity because they cared. Esther, beautiful story if you ever get time to read it. Esther was responsible for actually leading a nation away from genocide because they wanted to kill all the Jews. Paul cared. He cared so much that he actually carried the gospel, first of all, to the Gentile, and then he carried the message over to Rome and to the Roman Empire, and you and I became the recipients of what Paul cared about, taking the gospel to the uttermost parts of the world. And had he never gone to Rome, it would have never come and circled this nation, this world, until the church was built around the world. Paul cares. It all started with him. 
But then Jesus cared, and he went to a cross. He cared so much about your soul and my soul and about the souls of multiplied millions of people that he allowed himself to be suspended on a cross. He cared. Nehemiah cared so much that he volunteered. Like Isaiah, chapter 6, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw my God high and lifted up. And he talks about the angelic beings that were there and how that in the midst of all of that, he saw the glory of God. And as he saw the glory of God, he came so deep under conviction about his own sinfulness that as he lifted up his voice, those angelic beings placed coals of fire on his tongue and cauterized, taking away the sin of his lips. And I saw God high and lifted up. And I said, Lord, here am I. Send me. God wants volunteers. And do we really care enough to be that volunteer? Do we really care enough to examine the facts of our own life and the fact that God wants to use us? Do we care enough to weep over the deeds of those that are around us? Do we pray enough for his, God's help in our life? God wants volunteers. And just like building the wall back around Jerusalem, building up the wall in this area, reaching out to the community and inviting them to come in, not behind the walls of this building that we're in, but safe within the walls that have been spiritually prepared by our Father for every soul in this community. He brought me here for such a time as this. And you can say the same thing. You can say that this morning. God brought me here for such a time as this. And what he wants us to do now, be so bound together by a caring, loving, compassionate mentality that this community can see Christ in us because of our service to him. It's not my will, but thy will be done. And we'll find ourselves like Nehemiah, sitting down and weeping and mourning and praying and fasting when we really care. <laughs>